Hello and welcome to the Thought League, a show on thought leadership which aims at generating actionable ideas from the best thinking minds. Now today we are going to focus on the fast evolving tech world and we focus on demystifying the fascinating world of artificial intelligence, the opportunities as well as the risks there. Let me welcome on the show Noah Weisberg uh, from Kira Systems joining us straight from Toronto and Cyril Shroff of Cyril Amarchand Mangal Das right here in Mumbai. Thank you so much gentlemen for joining us on CNBC TV 18. Noah, starting with you, artificial intelligence has caught the imagination of the entire world. What is the scope that we are talking about? And as science fiction Hollywood movies have been predicting that are machines going to take over the humans? Is that what we are looking at? Well, uh, Misha, first of all, nice to be on here. Thank you for having me. Uh, artificial intelligence as it stands today tends to be narrow intelligences. So these are uh, computer programs that are very good at doing individual human tasks. Uh, what you're talking about with artificial intelligence sort of taking over the world um, is something that we think about from movies. So like the Terminator, uh, is that right? What you're kind of thinking about? Yes. So, so, so if that's so, uh, there's a lot of different estimates as to how far we are from these artificial super intelligences. And some are that we might see some, a super intelligence emerge in five years, and, but that's very much the minority view. Most people who are informed on this think that we're years away. Talking to one of my teammates, uh, he said that, in fact, we're likely to see people living on Mars before we see a artificial super intelligence. So, so it's, it's probably a long way out. And right now, the state of the art with AI is more something that's really good at doing an individual task, like helping select the next movie or TV show that you watch, or translating a document, or telling you what's in a picture, or finding information in a legal contract. Like That tends to be what artificial intelligence is really good at right now, and it tends to be really good at individual tasks and interestingly like the artificial intelligence that's really good at winning the game of go is different than the artificial intelligence that's really good at telling you which picture is of a dog and which picture is of a cat and that's different than the artificial intelligence that's really good at translating a document from hindi into english uh, and, and that tends to be the state of the art and it's just so different than what we think of as a human intelligence which is maybe really good at talking about artificial intelligence and reading a book, but also, you know, plays a mean game of squash and uh, can play the cello as well. Uh, that's not where artificial intelligence is today. All right. Uh, so taking off from where uh, Noah left, um, you know, Cyril Shroff, uh, what do you think about the scope of artificial intelligence uh, now in our daily lives? It's all around us. And how fast uh, do you think it's going to grow? So to build on what uh, Noah just said, I think the first thing to bear in mind is that there is a vast difference between artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence, or AGI as it's called. These two are chalk and cheese. A lot of what we experience today is artificial intelligence without the G in the middle. These are a set of narrow tasks, whether it's an Alexa or a Siri, a Siri or a uh, you know, auto or uh, driverless car, uh, or the AI that uh, you use for picking on you know specific themes, or, or the Kira uh, software which is used for analyzing contracts. Those are examples of narrow AI, and those are thriving. Yes. Uh, and I think they're going to get better and better. Yes. But we are a far way off from artificial general intelligence, and mm. the the estimates vary from five years by Elon Musk. Hmm. to 2,300 uh, uh, by an MIT professor, and there are a lot of options uh, in between. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's a while away, and uh, we should uh, actually uh, embrace it rather than fight it. Right. Uh, technology, I mean, you, you can, cannot ignore it. That's the truth today. But no, our artificial general intelligence, that's going to be the real superpower because right now human beings still have an upper hand over uh, technology by way of our multitasking ability and our ability to acquire different aptitude and acumen. Wouldn't you agree? 
Completely, Nisha. I think the idea of artificial general intelligence is both exciting and terrifying. Uh, I have young children, and there's a lot of tasks that I'm just smarter than them on. Like there are things that I know how to do uh, that they takes them a lot longer to figure out. Um, imagine something that's that relationship, but to me, like twice as smart as me or four times as smart as me. That could be amazing. Like there are all sorts of problems that we humans find very intractable. Right, whether it's climate change, cancer, how to solve the coronavirus. Um, perhaps if we were two times or four times or 10 times as smart, they'd be easy problems. Um, so that's the sort of opportunity with AI. The threat is that what if it's 10 times smarter than us and it's not nice <laughs> and it doesn't like us, then that's a really, really, really scary aspect. Uh, and also, this highlights why governments are so interested in reaching artificial general intelligence. Like, if you were 10 times smarter than other countries, you might literally be able to oppress them uh, or not. But it, it just it is a wonderful uh, opportunity for humanity, but also really a scary thing to create something that might be a lot smarter than us. Right, uh, but when we talk about the commercial usage, uh, say for example on your smartphone, what do you think the artificial intelligence does today which is useful and w give us a futuristic peek into what we are looking at in future uh, when it comes to its abilities in our daily use, uh, Noah? Well, in, in our daily use today, artificial intelligence it, uh, comes up a lot. So it, just as a person, if you talk to your phone, whether that's maybe Siri or Alexa or Cortana, um, that is an artificial intelligence that's sitting on the other side. If you're selecting a movie on Netflix or Amazon, probably artificial intelligence is helping guide you to what you end up watching. If uh, you use Google Translate, which I do quite a bit when I visit like a Finnish or German website, artificial intelligence is helping translate that for me into English. Um, when I go on my phone, I can see pictures of just one specific person, like my middle child, and artificial intelligence is helping guide me to just that picture. Um, all this is really cool. Uh, there's so many tasks going into the future that um, we may be able to do more and more. So right now, for example, artificial intelligence uh, in my car could help drive me part of the way uh, out of town, but it couldn't actually get me to the highway. And it probably wouldn't work if it was raining, maybe if it was night in Canada, but probably not for you. Uh, we have to worry about snow. The AI would not be able to drive the car in those situations. Um, but, but it can really do quite a lot. Um, similarly, in the work sphere, AI is uh, becoming very prevalent. So our technology, for example, is really good at finding data, like words, sentences, paragraphs in contracts. Uh, and it's great at doing that, but it still requires lawyers to do a lot of the analysis of what it's found means. Uh, increasingly, we're pushing into that sphere. Um, I think one thing we're seeing with lawyers as well is just AI that can start to take a crack at maybe drafting or negotiating contracts, but there's still quite a lot of human involvement in the process. And what I see in the future is just the AI taking people farther and farther to where they're trying to get to, uh, though still people being very involved in the loop. That's right. And uh, Cyril Shroff, I think uh, also in terms of commercial usage, it's going to be a huge money spinner in uh, the future. It already is. And the opportunities are huge going forward. Well, absolutely. There is, a, apart from the examples uh, which Noah gave, there are a lot of commercial applications already. For example, we use a lot of the uh, Noah software in terms of analyzing contracts. And it has done absolutely nothing in terms of re reducing the requirement of human lawyers, uh, but it has taken away some uh, mechanical tasks and voluminous tasks and simplified them. Then, for example, even in, in lending, in credit decisions, we had uh, Sanjeev Bajaj on this show uh, some weeks ago, and a lot of his business runs on the use of artificial intelligence for credit scores. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, we have a lot of doctors using artificial intelligence for robotic surgeries, uh, which can be very complicated. That doesn't do away with the need for the surgeon. And finally, it's the surgeon who takes responsibility. Sure. So these are tools that are available to enhance human beings. Yes. And uh, they are not replacing human beings at all. All right, so that's an important statement coming in. Thank you so much, uh, but hold your thoughts there. So we'll slip into a short breather on this note, but human intervention is still very important while the usage of technology is growing fast. But where all human biases and intelligence and the sense of judgment comes in, we'll discuss more on that when we return on The Thought League. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching the Thought League and we are discussing uh, the fascinating world of artificial intelligence, the scope opportunities, as well as the threats and risks involved. And we have with us Noah Weisberg as well as Cyril Shroff. Now, Cyril Shroff earlier made a very important uh, comment that it's uh, human beings are going to be still relevant. Noah Weisberg, let's reflect on that particular aspect. The whole aspect of the human judgment is going to really continue and that's where the human beings are going to add value and also consume this technology to their benefit. Exactly. Uh, once upon a time, I was a junior corporate lawyer and I spent vast amounts of time doing work that it just didn't feel like I should do, that um, I, I was not that good at, that wasn't that much fun. Uh, it was really like the worst part of my day. And eventually I quit and built a company that helps automate this work. And it now takes work that uh, really highly educated, highly trained people are doing, and it helps them do it faster and more accurately. And, and that makes their lives just better. Like they spend less time on drudgery, more time doing interesting work. The other interesting thing is, is that it's not just that they can do the work that they would have done before, but now, thanks to the technology, they're able to expand the scope of what they're able to review because the technology is helping them be so much more efficient. And that allows them to do much better, uh, more valuable work for customers overall. Right. And uh, Cyril Shroff, I want to extrapolate on the point you made about redundancy. There will be some job losses, you think. What's your view on that aspect? Do you think that a lot of lower skilled uh, workforce will go out of uh, the workforce? So short answer is that I think there will be job losses of, uh, of some kind, but there will be a lot of new jobs that will be created and new skills will be re required. So this yes. is something which is called Jevon's paradox, yes. where uh, efficient technology is set to sort of reduce costs and creates more users. But there is overall a vast increase in uh, in consumption. So whilst there will be loss of some lower level jobs uh, or repetitive jobs, you will see a whole array of new jobs being created. For example, uh, data analysts. For example, AI ethicists. Uh, these are these are new categories of jobs which don't exist. And more than 35 to 40 percent of jobs will require existing jobs will require reskilling, mm -hmm. where they can work with uh, with some of these uh, new tools uh, that are available. Look what's happened in the world of finance as well. I mean, for example, there are traders, but uh, now there is algo trading as well. It doesn't mean that you don't need human beings. I think the fact is that there is a really a partnership between man and machine, yes, which creates enormous power. Yes. All right. So how you use uh, this particular power that comes with technology is the main defining factor and the game changer of the future. Uh, Noah Weisberg, would you agree with that? And to the point of job losses, you have to be relevant. Is the adoption of new skill set happening at the same pace as the technology is moving right now? Well, so I think in terms of job loss, the way to think of it is if you do a work, if your job consists of doing work that could be automated by AI, that's probably not a great situation to be in and you should really be trying to upskill. But if it's using the product of what AI does or part of what your job is, is using the product of what AI does, then you could be really well placed to be able to extend your capabilities further. Um, in terms of the reskilling work, 
I think there are lots of people who we see rescaling. For example, I think there's associates at uh, Sierra Lemachand who are using our technology, who once were uh, probably just regular <laughs> human lawyers, but now are tech enhanced lawyers. And I think those people have been rescaling. So I think there are lots of uh, instances of people rescaling. But what we saw in the first industrial revolution was that there were some people who um, were left behind by that technological change. They didn't, they weren't able to embrace it. They perhaps didn't have the education to embrace it, um, and, and they were left behind. And I think it, it's entirely possible that that same thing plays out today uh, for individual people as well as employers who would like to do their best in this environment. Uh, the best thing they can do is really try to expose their people to artificial intelligence early and get them to work with it so they can learn um, how to work with it in the future. Right, but Noah, I, I want, add? yes, sure, sure. Nisha, I actually, uh, I'd like to add uh, that, you know, artificial intelligence is also helping in respect of certain human aspects. For example, we have two blind lawyers in the firm who are using this system and they're able to do stuff who could uh, they couldn't do otherwise. And they're doing it as well as the other lawyers, sometimes even better. So, okay, so that's, uh, that's so an amazing, is... amazing example of uh, how technology is being used uh, at this point. And I'm sure there are many great examples uh, of uh, this as well. But Noah, I want you to reflect on one aspect. And this is a controversial one. And let's take it head on here while we are talking about the world of artificial intelligence, right? Uh, so what about the human biases? Ultimately, the data that is fed into the system is what is being processed, and that's the artificial intelligence that is developed for a smooth functioning, right? And uh, to, to help in our functioning and operations. Now, what about the in inherent biases of the human beings in feeding that data and in training the technology for it? Well, uh, that's a very good question, Nisha, and, and a real problem. Like, it has come up before. There have been, for example, there was a uh, U.S. system that was supposed to give parole to people and make parole decisions, and it, it was making biased parole decisions based on race. Um, the thing, though, about artificial intelligence is it's just a tool, and it learns from what it's taught, and it recreates what it's taught. So, in fact, um, one of the neat things about artificial intelligence is that it can illustrate to us biases that we may not have known were there, right? If you end up with a biased artificial intelligence tool and it's been trained on a set of data, you know that that training data had bias in it. So, for example, if it was trained on past legal judgments and you know that it's, um, say, treating black people worse, then you know that some of those past legal judgments may not have been entirely fair to black people. Uh, and then, as one of the creators of the AI, you can tweak the AI so that it becomes more neutral. So actually, in fact, in this case, it's a situation where we can take an AI um, that was previously in a situation where previously people were being treated in a biased way, and thanks to the AI showing us that this bias was there, we can try to take the bias out of the system. So I think. Um, there is a threat that it'll just reproduce biases that people already have, but there's also an opportunity that we can use it um, to take biases out of the system. And I think this speaks to a broader point, right, which is that AI is just a tool. Um, it, it can be used for good or it can be used for ill. And it, it's in our hands as the creators and users of AI to decide which one we care about. Right, and uh, Cyril Shroff, so how do we uh, really strike the right balance uh, when it comes to synthesizing the human knowledge uh, and the biases in feeding data and there and also later making the judgment calls? Those two are going to be pivotal to the usage of artificial intelligence as well. So the uh, ethical challenge in relation to the use of AI is one of the greatest global challenges that the world is facing in relation to the march of, uh, of AI. And it's sort of based on the general principle of garbage in, garbage out. So if we have to get society to trust uh, AI, then it must uh, meet certain characteristics, one of which is the absence of bias, hmm. uh, which, which could be gender bias, race bias, all of it. And it depends really on 
fixing accountability. So if there was a bias, who do you hold accountable? Do you hold the machine accountable? Do you hold the creator accountable? Do you use the quality of data accountable? So these are questions that society needs to answer. And the solution is that policy must evolve to find a framework in which it can fix accountability. Now, this is already being done. Uh, Singapore, US, EU have very recently, in the last eight, nine months, each of them have come up with uh, a leading thought papers and policy papers on the ethical use of AI. And India is not too far behind. Hmm. Niti Aayog has put up a paper for ethical use of AI in all their initiatives. And there's an ongoing conversation going on in Delhi, hmm. which the government is standing behind on the use of ethical AI. And people are commenting uh, on it. So the conversation is now mainstream. Bias is one element of it, but it is finally about creating trust in fixing accountability and being able to verify. So if there was a problem in the use of an AI, can you go in and check and find out where the problem was and fix accountability on it? And this is one of the most uh, difficult challenges in the use of AI and humanity will have to solve it. Noah, uh, what do you have to say about how have we dealt with these challenges so far? Is it in the right direction so far? I think so. I think uh, AI is something that really has captured public imagination. So there, there has been quite a lot of focus on making sure that it's been built right. And I think it's something where AI creators uh, generally tend to really care about the ethical implications of their work. And there is just so much focus on it. Um, I think sometimes the focus is probably a little uh, driven by worries about things uh, on <laughs> omnipotent APIs like the Terminator and maybe not as much the real life uh, AIs of today that are helping pull data out of contracts or you know, spot fraud on credit cards. But, um, but I think the attention on it is really a good thing and will make AI better. So there's probably been some individual choices that uh, are imperfect, but on the whole, I think we're going in the right direction. All right. I would uh, agree with that. Yes, all right. So we have a united uh, and a, a united view of, on, on the panel when it comes to the scope and the future of artificial intelligence. But thank you so much, uh, Noah, as well as Cyril, uh, for this riveting conversation. And of course, uh, this is something which is extremely, extremely fascinating at this point. And we are all together seeing how it unfolds going forward and takes over our lives even more. Thank you so much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. So that was the view coming in on artificial intelligence. There's a long road ahead. Artificial general intelligence is going to be another uh, era of technology that we are going to see and that's going to define the future changes. The companies which are future ready are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. With that, it's a wrap on the Thought League. Thanks so much for tuning in.